and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. Los Angeles, California. I work here. It was Wednesday, November 21st. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery division. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Chief of Detective Thad Brown. My name's Friday. During the past two months, a series of robberies and beatings had occurred in the South Los Angeles area. All of the victims were women. We had an M.O. and a vague description. Now all we needed was the suspect. probably know why you're here. It's on those purse snatchings that Friday and Smith been working on. Now, this thing is getting way out of hand. He struck again night before last and his victim's in county hospital in a critical condition. She's been pistol whipped and the doctor says she's got a skull fracture. Mm -hmm. If this keeps up, it's only a matter of time till somebody gets killed. That's why I've asked you to come in. It's up to you to see if that doesn't happen. <coughs> You've all got the M.O. sheets. Now, that's all the information we have. I know, some of it's pretty broad, but it's the best we've been able to come up with. Friday and Smith handled the investigation until now, so I'll let them give you the details. All right, Joe? You'll notice on your M.O. sheets that all of the crimes have been listed in the order that they occurred. There's a description of the clothing that the suspect wore and a description of the suspect whenever we could get it. You'll also notice that in a lot of cases, there's quite a difference in the physical description of the suspect. However, we've been able to put them all together and we've come up with a composite drawing that should look something like him. The one thing that's fairly consistent is the description of the clothing the suspect wears. It's almost always dark. He usually has on a hat and he's been known to wear a top coat. The hat and the coat are also of dark material. Now, if you'll take a look at the map here, you'll notice that we've pinpointed all the jobs that we know about to give you a little clearer picture of his operation. Can you all see this here? Sure. Yeah. The first one took place on 73rd Street. The rest of the pins show the jobs from then on. They move all the way up to Vernon. Now, he's also worked Western Avenue and Manchester Boulevard. He'll hit any street where there's a streetcar or a bus line. He works between the hours of 5.30 and 11 p.m. And the approach is almost always the same. Frank Smith will tell you about that. All right, Frank? The victim gets off a streetcar or a bus, starts to walk home. And as soon as the woman reaches an area that's not well lighted or that hasn't got much traffic, the suspect walks up behind her and grabs her. After that, he tries to take her purse. If she offers any resistance, he slugs her. Because of the fact that two of the victims have seen a gun in his hand, we know he's armed. The gun's been described as a revolver. Does the suspect have a car, Joe? Well, we assume that he has. A couple of times, people have seen him running through their yards. It's a pretty safe bet that he's got a getaway car parked on a side street. Now, at least we know he leaves the area immediately. Then nobody's actually seen a vehicle. That's right. We've had a couple of calls, but they didn't check out. Now, the plan here is to use police women as decoys and try to bait him into the open. That's the reason the women officers were called to this meeting. You figured to work the main arterials? Yeah. There'll be two officers assigned to each police woman. We've been able to obtain five in all. That means that ten officers will be assigned to them. Other officers will be in the area somewhere. One of the things to look for is a vehicle that trails a streetcar or a bus. Now, are there any other questions? How do we get our assignments? The skipper has a list, Lomi. All of the officers who are to work with a policewoman are noted. The others are given the areas that they're supposed to patrol. What about the other calls coming in? Who's going to handle them? Those officers not assigned to a policewoman. There'll be units from the division on the operation, too. They'll lend us a hand. But remember this. If you're assigned to a policewoman decoy, don't leave her under any circumstances. Now, is that clear? Don't leave the policewoman. If we run into any problems, who do we call? Well, Smith and I will be in the area. You can get in touch with us. What happens if we pick up a suspect? Well, use your own judgment. If you think it's a routine pickup, take him to robbery and he'll be processed here. Any other questions? No. 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 Well, I guess that covers it. You all know about the cancellation of days off. Sorry it has to hit just before Thanksgiving, but that's the way it's got to be. Nobody draws any time unless things cleared up. Yeah. And Murphy, 
It won't do any good to have your wife call me. You're still gonna have to work. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's about it. Operation starts tonight and goes until the suspect's in custody. Uh, have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, just a second, one more thing. The worksheet's posted on the board in the front office. You can all check it on your way out. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Well, you need anything else to carry this off? Yeah, we could use a little luck. No reason for you to be different. Huh? Suspect's had his share. Frank and I left the office and drove out to the stakeout area. Because the suspect had never hit the same street more than once, it was decided that police women would board streetcars and buses and get off at points where previous robberies had not taken place. During the night, several possible suspects were picked up for questioning. We checked them out. Our man wasn't among them. The next day, Thursday, November 22nd, 3 p.m., Frank and I stopped off in a diner to get some lunch. How's yours? It's all right, I guess. Well, it's sure a new one on me. Huh? Sliced rabbit for Thanksgiving dinner? Yeah. Well, I've had it, Joe. Afraid so. Is everything all right? Yes, yeah, just fine. We're not very hungry. How about dessert? Just the check, please. You got it coming, mince pie. Well, that's all right. Can we have a check? Suit yourself. You can keep it. Thanks. And happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving. Two nights went by. Saturday, November 24th, 11.30 p.m. Well, it's beginning to look like this wasn't such a hot idea. Yeah, I'm afraid you're right. You think he got wise to the operation? Could be. I don't see how, though. I got some. Thanks, Joe. I got a light, though. Want to bet? Well, I thought I did. I got mine. Thanks. Well, I know about you, but how about the family? They have a nice Thanksgiving? They didn't. No? No, she had the in-laws down. Boy, that guy can eat. Armand, huh? Yeah. According to Faye, he finished off a 22-pound turkey. Well, he must have had some help. Yeah, he did. Kirk ate as much as he did. Kirk. My nephew. Oh, yeah. You've heard me talk about him, Joe, little Kirk. That's Armand's kid. In more ways than one. He sure got his old man's appetite. <laughs> 1K80. 1K80. Meet unit 1K87 at the 300 block, East 51st Street. 300 block, East 51 Street. Go to. 1K80 Roger, KMA 367. <laughs> One of the police women decoys had gotten off the streetcar at Main and 51st. She'd walked east and a man had approached her. He demanded money. When the officers following the police woman arrived at the scene, he was taken into custody and we were contacted. Apparently, the suspect had been drinking. We took him down to the police building for interrogation. All right, what's your name? I don't like your attitude, young man. Well, we don't care about that. You just give us your name. I don't believe I feel like telling you. You got a wallet. There's nothing in it at the moment. I happen to be in a state of financial embarrassment. All right, come on, fella. Empty your pockets on the table. All right. But understand, after this, I plan to register an official protest concerning these methods of yours. Yeah, sure, we know all that. Just get your wallet up, will you? All right, young man. Take out the money. I told you before, there's nothing in it. I'm not at the moment in a solvent state. In other words, no juice. Well, suppose you empty it anyway. This your true name, Victor Nathaniel Templer? Are you suggesting that I use an alias? Now, look, cut out the smart cracks, Templer. Where do you live? At the moment, I am without lodging. In other words, no pad. You got a job? As a matter of fact, I haven't. Have you ever had a job? From time to time. Doing what? I have worked in the vineyards of California. Grape picker, huh? Quite the contrary. I am a professional wine taster. 
You've been tasting a little bit too much of it tonight, though, haven't you? I am in complete control of my faculties. Well, then, suppose you tell us what you were doing out on 51st Street. Just looking around. For a vineyard? I was strolling down the street, lost in my own thoughts, when this young woman approached me. In other words, she tried to pick me up. Oh, sure. The girl was a policewoman. That didn't come out until later. You ever been arrested before, Templer? Apparently, I am under arrest now. Before this? Uh, there have been occasional previous contacts with other members of your profession. In other words, I've fallen. What charges? I believe you call it vagrancy. You ever done time in California? I really don't know. Now, come on, come on, Templar. Have you ever done time in this state? I am trying to be completely honest, Sergeant. There have been a number of these unfortunate encounters with the law. I'm not just certain in which state they all occurred. I'll check him out. I'm surprised you don't feel ashamed of yourself. How's that? I mean your procedure here tonight. Using a policewoman to lure a poor, innocent man into all this embarrassment. How long you been in Los Angeles, Temper? Well, I really don't know. I'm not very good at dates. Uh-huh. I'm quite certain that I came here sometime this year. Is that as close as you can come? I'm afraid so. Time is relative, you know, Sergeant. Yeah, it sure is. If you haven't got a job, how do you live? It's a hand-to-mouth existence at best. I'll bet. And by the way, when this matter is all cleared up, and you and your cohorts have given me the apology I deserve... Yes? Uh, may I ask that you put a little something in that wallet of mine? Uh, something that wasn't there before? Well, now, you just got a real big picture of that, haven't you, Templar? Joe? Yeah. See you a minute. You stay put. You will find me here when you return. I checked our friend through R&I. &I. He's been tagged 92 times for drunk in L.A. 92 times? Yeah. Doesn't sound like our man, though. Why not? Last three months, he's been in Camarillo. Monday, November 26th, 10.31 a.m. We talked to the superintendent of the state hospital at Camarillo. He told us that Victor Templer had been released only 10 days earlier. He had spent three months undergoing treatment for alcoholism. The operation continued. Each night, five police women boarded streetcars and buses in the area the suspect was known to work. Five police cars carrying 10 officers followed them. Another 20 patrolled the immediate area looking for the thief. As a result of the publicity the crimes had received, calls flooded the complaint board and women refused to walk the streets alone after dark. But the robberies and sluggings continued. Tuesday, December 4th, the manager of a cheap hotel in the Skid Row area called and said she had something for us. Right down this way, it's the last room. Just what is it you want us to see? Just wait till we get there and I'll show you. Here we are, 24. <clears throat> Hadn't you better knock first? Well, he ain't in, can't you see? Yes, ma'am. What kind of a head do you think I have? I read all of your magazines. Besides, I saw that he wasn't in before I ever called you guys. Put your muscles behind this, will you? <clears throat> Good boy. <laughs> well, come on in now. It was when I was cleaning up this morning. My regular girl took sick, so I had to do it myself. That's when I found him in the closet. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Up on the back shelf there. You better take that chair over. The minute I spotted him, I felt I should call the police. They're way in the back. Way in the back. Now, well, you see them? Yes, ma'am. What do you got? A couple of women's purses. I'll be careful of fingerprints. Yes, ma'am. I might as well tell you. I kind of touched them this morning. I know I had a daughter, but I just didn't stop to think. <clears throat> There's an awful lot of junk in them. Oh, you opened these purses, did you? Well, I just kind of peeked. Struck me so darn peculiar, them being there. Uh-huh. 
Uh, there ain't no money in them, just cards and papers and stuff like that. Whose room is this? Well, he gave his name as Jerry Kilgallen when he registered. Might not be his real one, though. Yes, ma'am. You take the room alone? Absolutely. This is a hotel for men. We don't allow no women in here. You find some identification, Joe? No, these aren't any of our victims. We'll have to check them out, though. Sure. We better get this one to the crime lab. Huh? Here, on the lining. Yeah. Well, what is it? You find something? Well, we're not sure yet. Well, what is it? I called you. I got a right to know, ain't I? Looks like blood stains. <laughs> manager gave us Jerry Kilgallen's description and the registration card he'd signed. Frank called it into R&I. They had no record on him. The crime lab checked the purses and ran a precipitate test on the one with the stains. They reported that the stains had been caused by human blood. Kilgallen's hotel was staked out and he was taken into custody. Under interrogation, he admitted that he'd stolen the purses from women in a downtown department store. He gave us the date and the time of the thefts and they checked out with previous crime reports. He also told us that when he had snatched the second purse, he'd cut his hand on the clasp and that the blood stains were his own. A blood type test tended to verify his story. We were satisfied that Kilgallen was not responsible for the other robberies and beatings and he was booked on a charge of suspicion of grand theft person. That night, Frank and I took up our place in the operation, cruising a part of the stakeout area. At approximately 8.45 p.m., we got a call, 2.11 and slugging. All units converged on the area. A block-by-block -block search was made. All suspicious individuals were stopped, checked, and questioned. Additional officers were called in to aid in the hunt. Every alley, every street was gone over. Her name was Joan Gorham. Have you caught him yet? No, ma'am, not yet. You feeling all right? I could sure use a cigarette. When he got my purse, he took everything except my sunglasses. They were in my pocket. Guess they got broken. Put them on because my eye's such a mess. Thank you. It's pretty bad, isn't it? Did you get a good look at the man? Yes, but it was dark. Couldn't see him very well. It came as such a surprise. I've, I've never had anything like this happen to me before. Yes, we can understand that. Can you tell us anything at all about him? His face? I can remember that much. Ruddy. He had a ruddy complexion. And I think he had a mustache. Now, what about his eyes? Could you tell us what color they were? I don't know. I couldn't say. How about his hair? I don't know. I really don't. All I can remember was his face. Now, according to the other officer's report, you had just gotten off the bus at 71st in Vermont when this took place. Is that right? Yes, that's right. I was on my way home. I'm a cashier at the Oak Tree Cafeteria. Uh-huh. Did the man say anything to you? Well, not at first. He just grabbed my purse. And when I wouldn't give it to him, he started hitting me with his fist. Did he have a gun, do you know? That's what made me think he was going to kill me. After he hit me, I fell down and he pulled the gun. Said he'd shoot if I made a sound. Then he ran off. That's all I know. I can't tell you anything more. All right, thank you very much, Miss Gorham. We won't take up any more of your time. I sure hope you catch him. I've been reading about it in the papers. All those other women. Never thought it would happen to me. We've got a lot of men assigned to this case, and it shouldn't be too long now. Oh, say, here's one other thing. Almost slipped my mind. Yes, ma'am, what's that? Well, maybe I couldn't tell you too much about what he looked like, but you'll know him when you see him. Oh? While we were fighting, I scratched the left side of his face. Righty. Yeah, Hatch? Just got a call from your office. Yeah. They've got your suspect pinned down in the warehouse district, code three. Whereabouts? It's Lawson and Dover. He's trying to shoot his way out. <laughs> Attention, all units. 
All units on frequency seven, please stand by. Hey, we got a live one this time. Sounds like a deadly. All units in the vicinity of the 200 block on Slauson. 211 suspect in area. Last seen entering warehouse 261 South Slauson. Suspect is armed, code three. Frequency seven clear. Lean on it. <laughs> That's our guy, all right. Finally made his mistake, Joe. Tried to slug a policewoman. Rafferty and I were following him. He spotted us, made a break. She okay? Yeah, fine. She had a hold on him, but he broke away, ducked into an apartment house. By the time we got the blockades up and the area covered, he'd worked his way down here into the warehouse district. Uh-huh. Started firing at a black and white unit out on Sloss, and then he broke in here. We gave him a chance to walk out. He picked this instead, tried to take that uniform man with him. Who is he? Name's Barney Swanson. Suspect emptied his gun into him. How's he doing? Seems to be holding his own. Hamlet's is on the way. Right, thanks. How's it going, Swanson? I'm going to be all right. Sure you are. You from downtown? That's right. Friday, Central Robbery. Hope to be down there with you someday. How many years you got? Four. Studying for the exam now. Did you have much trouble making it? No, not too much, Barney. Just hit those books as hard as you can. You'll make it all right. Anything we can get you? No, I'm doing fine. If I can just keep enough of this stuff in me till they plug up the holes. There comes your chauffeur. Never been in the P and F ward before. They tell me it's pretty good. All you gotta do is eat and go, Brick. Say, could you do me a favor? Sure. Call my wife. Don't give her the whole picture, though. Just tell her I cut my finger. All right. What's the number? It's, uh... It's funny. I can't think of it. Just moved into a new housing unit out in the valley. Out in the valley. Great guy I am to be wearing a badge. Can't even remember my own phone number. You got it written down? In my wallet. Back pocket. Don't worry about the money, Friday. I trust you. <laughs> it's on the back of a white card in there someplace. Tell me about the PNF ward. This ever happened to you? Yeah, once. But I didn't have it as good as you will. My partner and I were trying to take a couple of guys out of a hotel room, and they were heavy. I thought I caught one in my left shoulder. Turned out that the slug only broke the skin. <laughs> they okayed me for duty in 48 hours. You'll draw at least six weeks of easy living out of this. Is this a card bar? Used to be. He just moved. shame. Huh? One of them spent his life trying to keep the law and the other one used his trying to break it. Both men dead. It's a big difference. Hmm? Only one man died tonight. December 3rd, an inquest was held in the coroner's office in and for the county of Los Angeles, state of California. In a moment, the results of that inquest. After an examination of the evidence and hearing the testimony, the coroner's jury ruled that the suspect's death was justifiable homicide. 